Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, and I am the cool internet person who shows you this game. It's time for episode 7, which is chapter 6 of Mirror's Edge, a brilliant flawed masterpiece that I love deeply. So before I start, there's a couple things I want to touch on really quickly. First off, it is November the 5th, which is the UK's National Explosions Night. So you may hear loud bangs in the background. Don't worry, that's just someone trying to kill the sky. Um, secondly, it's tonight when this is released. Um, and probably in the past for when you're watching this, that is going to be the first stream of my playthrough of Hollow Knight. I've been looking forward to streaming that for a long time, and my regularly scheduled uh, streams will be Tuesday and Friday nights at 6pm UK time. I'm going to work my way through that game, and... I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you join me. If you can't make the first one, I hope you'll, you know, catch up and, and watch as I discover the one of the most beautiful games I've ever played. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be that. Do go follow me on Twitter if you want to keep up with both my general state of things because, oh, that brings me to my third announcement, which is that um, basically there might be some disruptions to my schedule soon because I'm being evicted and also I'm very ill. So... I will have to manage all of those things. I'd like to not miss any episodes and not miss any sch scheduled streams, but you never know. Just be aware. I don't have any real way of reaching you all, apart from saying things at the start of these videos, so do go and follow me on Twitter, because it's so much easier for me to just post announcements there. Uh, all my links are in the description. So anyway, all of that housekeeping out of the way, let's jump into the game. Faithy, nice of you to drop by. With a little bit of persuasion, Ropeburn was pretty chatty. Told me about his meeting with Pope's killer at the mall. And you're thanking me, right? <sighs> but when I got there, guess who was waiting for me? No idea, Faithy. I just go there for the pretzels. Bad case of the blues. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? No, Faithy. It wasn't me. Besides, if I wanted you dead, don't you think I would have just killed you myself? You're right. A creep like you couldn't have organized it. Now, don't be like that. Ropeburn's dead. I'm impressed. Wasn't me. You need to be careful who you hang around with. Oh, I learned that a long time ago. And yet, here we are again. But I'm afraid I'm gonna have to cut this little meeting short, Faithy. Places to be, you know how it is. Try not to get yourself killed. Merc. Merc, you can stop pretending not to listen now. <laughs> What's up? Can you do a search on Perundella Kruger security? On it. Why do you ask? I've been seeing their name around. In Ropeburn's office and somewhere else. Distinctive logo. Getting anything? Mm hmm. Just what you'd expect. Alarms, fencing, armored cars, private security. Oh, and they secure our world, apparently. Where are they based? A few offices around town. Just got a new place down near the docks. Get me some coordinates. I'm gonna go check it out. Head toward the building with the big stupid dog symbol. Loading bay should be a way in. So I have a bunch I want to say about this chapter in general, um, but I actually want to go off on a little rant that I've been meaning to go on ever since episode one and I keep forgetting to. I want to talk about how unlikely it is that this got, game got made and how unlikely it is that certain aspects of it exist. So for context, I want you to bear in mind that this game was made uh, this game was made by Dice, who are most famous for the Battlefield series of games, which is the main competitor to Call of Duty. Call of Duty and Battlefield are of course the like biggest, most famous, most um, valuable, what's the word, um, highest earning games in the most right-wing genre that exists, the modern military shooter. Yes. So uh, keep that in mind, and then also bear in mind the fact that um, it was published by EA, uh, Electronic Arts, who are the most, well not the most, but they are a very risk-averse publisher, generally speaking, and they certainly were at the time. Um, it's 
kind of remarkable this game got made because not only is it a political statement, which is unheard of in games, the games industry famously declares itself to be apolitical, despite the fact that every single game that is made is a political, estate, a political statement, especially the extremely right-wing one, ones like Call of Duty. Um, and, um, yeah, so consider that, and then also consider the fact that this game, at a time when the industry was somehow even more of a um, straight, white, uh, male boys club, like, the industry has huge problems with that sort of thing now. It had even huger problems with it then, and at least now these problems are talked about more, more generally in public. Um, so, this is a game with a uh, completely non-sexualized person of colour woman as the protagonist. How did that happen? That's remarkable, in all honesty. Um, it was a bit of a weird fight. Oh god. So, uh, yeah, this area is pretty easy to get through if you aren't trying to make a point about how impressive this game was for its time on a sort of social justice kind of grounds. And I'm not talking about this because I'm like, oh, it got this many wokeness points, therefore it must be good. I'm saying that in that climate, it's remarkable that all of these different aspects were included in the game. Like, this is a woman who would have been so easy to sexualize, and yet she's wearing 100% appropriate attire for her job at all times. It doesn't even fall into the tropes of the um, strong female protagonist, which is the kind of um, ostensibly well-meaning but actually undermines its own point trend you see in a lot of... Um, Jesus Christ. In, in a lot of movies, games, TV shows and so on. It avoids all of that. It has, for a protagonist, a woman whose closest relationships are with women, her sister, her best friend. Mercury is not a romantic figure, he is a father figure. And her gender is completely uncommented on and irrelevant to the entire plot. Like, name a game that does that now. And this was in 2008. Like, that's just one of the reasons why I love this game so much. It's so respectful and it's so spectacularly unlikely that it would have been. Um, anyway, so yeah. The major downside, well, one of the many major downsides to be living in a police state is that um, corporate governmental control means that there are very few worker safety regulations. So as the song goes, come with me and you'll be in a world of OSHA violations. Anyway, it's time to get through one of the hardest rooms in this section of the game, I think, entirely. Uh, I might need to cut here. Hello, future Tessa here for what might be the first time in this game. Anyway, I'm here to tell you really quickly why this room is so difficult. Basically, it boils down to the fact that it's got four guys in it, all of whom will shoot you, and all of you have overlapping fields of fire. Um, the trick is to stun this one guy and get out as fast as possible, but the room is all is designed around being an open exploration area, and these two ideas just fight each other. They do not get along at all. Um, it does not work at all to try and have the idea of a space that you run around and smoothly explore and a space you fight people in and also these guys who are overpowered for the area they are in. Also it's full of exploding barrels. Also I just want to point out that this um, must be another disguised loading screen but it's very oddly placed. The way the room is designed kind of implies that you should be continuing your flow state and sprint through, spring water up, dive through that hole. But the fact that there's steam there means you have to wait. which kind of doesn't fit the way that the area is designed. And what I wonder is if maybe the area was designed first and then split up to make loading possible later. But that's completely speculation. That's the switch we need. That's a door that's locked. So, um, yeah. One of the reasons why that room is so difficult is there's two guys who are facing each other and then two guys who show up later if you run around too much. There's also explosive barrels everywhere, which will kill you, but not the guys. Um, it's a very difficult fight if you try to fight it. And also, unless you know where you are going, um, it's quite difficult to find your way, which means that you have to either try and run around and figure out where you're supposed to go while under fire, or you... Um, have to beat four guys all with machine guns and um, well they have like mp5s so that's not technically a machine gun but that's not relevant also this is a neat little easter egg
Also, you can kick this door down from this side, but not the other side. Uh, but yeah, so it's basically just a very difficult room to do for a lot of reasons, but it also represents um, something of a change in the design philosophy of the game at this point. It's kind of visible previously as well. But the game goes from being focused on these flow sections where it's about, you know, instinctively reacting to your environment and um, charting a path as you go and becomes more about observing your environment and figuring out where you need to go and then figuring out how to get there. So this, cha this chapter switches back and forth between those, but it's where we start to get more of the big environmental sections a bit more commonly. Um, but yeah, so I think that this is perfectly acceptable, but when this becomes a problem is when you combine it with um, having to do combat as well, because you can't explore and figure out at your own pace what you need to do because you're being shot at, but you also can't fight the guys because the, the space is so heavily to your disadvantage. Also, this is another nice little easter egg. Hey man, yeah, I know, I just don't really give a shit anymore. This asshole has been on my case since I started here. I think it might have been something to do with my aunt Libby holding that free speech blah 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 rally last year and now he thinks I'm one of them airhead liberals. I don't have a problem with being checked on, I've got nothing to hide, so I just pity the douche that has to sit and monitor what porn sites I visit. But whatever, I'm quitting anyway, I got myself a cushy government job running a crane for Callahan over at Riding Park, so I'm just gonna pop down to HR real quick and give them the good news. I just got a note telling me they want to talk to me about something too. Maybe it's a promotion, lol. <coughs> and yes, a thousand time yes. I thought I was the only one noticing, but yeah, this place has gotten so weird. I'm not even sh uh, Excuse me? I'm not even sure it's a legit operation anymore since that douchebag wrestler bought it. I mean, what the hell are we supposed to produce here? The first thing they did was get rid of all the machines and equipment that do something, and now all we do is move boxes around, not to mention that big-ass supervillain logo they put up everywhere. WTF? I tried asking Owen about it last week, but you just told me to mind my own business. So, that's what I'm doing, and I'm not looking back. I'll try my best to see if I can get you hooked up at the new place. The pay is good, and the benefits are totally awesome. The missus is well happy. Which is a... Weirdly British thing for him to say. Uh, well, time to go home. I've been idling for two hours playing Tales of Runeworld, so I'm about ready to punch out, hee <laughs> hee. I just hope no one reads this or I'll be in big trouble. Haha, <laughs> what are they gonna do? I'm quitting anyway. It's not like they can tie me to a chair and beat me up for quitting my job. So yeah, there's kind of a lot of loaded stuff going on in that. I'm sure you can uh, figure it all out for yourself, but it's interesting to see what the um, common person's life might be like in this um, panopticon dystopia. It's also interesting to see how different it is down here as compared to upstairs, although um, an orange and white colour scheme like this always makes me think of ice cream. Delicious, refreshing ice cream on a hot day. I blame Solero advertising for those of you who are British and remember your childhoods in the 90s. But yeah, we are about to blow the entire plot of the game wide open, so time for a cutscene. Nerve center. Murder. Could be some kind of training room. Drake. What are they training them for? You mean there's something left in the city they haven't managed to tax, ban, or regulate? What the hell's left, huh? Us. Merc, get your gun. You know that's never too far away. Why? This this training, Merc. This Project Icarus, Pirandello Kruger, they're not here to bolster the police. They're being trained to come after us. After the runners. All the runners. Everything okay up there? Quite as grave. Just me, birds, and the best black market surveillance equipment money can buy. It's him. Him? The guy I saw at the mall. Just seen him on a camera, on the deck of a boat at the dock. Walk of faith. You've done enough. Right now, it seems you're sitting in the lion's den. So please, all that's out of there. Chatter's gone berserk. Blues know you're there. Get out now. I love that she decides to stand here for a second so that I get to watch their, like, Super Sentai goon villain intro as they stand up and flex in front of me. Um, these are the Pursuit Cops. They're going to be showing up a few times throughout the rest of the game, but not massively frequently. 
And yeah, this is the answer to what Project Icarus is. It's an attempt to train evil um, parkour guys to <laughs> to counteract the good parkour guys who are passing messages for dissident factions or just anyone who wants privacy in the Panopticon. This is actually a really nicely designed area and it visually is designed, I think, based on actual like parkour training grounds that exist in real life. But uh, yeah, so the plot thickens. You may or may not have noticed this, but uh, Celeste's file when it popped up had her, had her everything listed as classified, unlike the others who had various pieces of information. That's going to be relevant. Um, but yeah, um, I think that it's interesting the way this level goes from being this kind of like zone exploration where you have to try and figure out what buttons to press to unlock things to uh, then suddenly switching back into the um, more traditional flow mechanics. I think that if you were choosing to be extremely wanky, you could use this to make a point about how the mechanics thematically reflect Faith's kind of change in attitude. She's gone from um, being investigative and trying to figure out what's going on. She's exploring areas as we are exploring areas. She is investigating and gathering information and trying to sort things out and solve a puzzle in her mind as we try to solve a puzzle in space. Then we get our horrible revelation and after we get our horrible revelation it goes back into flow and much like Faith's currently goal-oriented self, we are determinedly sprinting towards a goal based on instinct. That might be unintentional, or it might be very clever. Nice work. Look, I'm gonna try and get the word out on the network about Icarus. Warn the other runners. Do it. I'm going after that guy. Hopefully I made my extremely out there points in clear enough of a fashion that it all made sense, but you never know. But yeah, that is all gonna be all from me for today. I hope you join me for streams at six o'clock on Tuesdays and Fridays, and yeah. Join me for the rest of this story. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.